First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Marisa Bailey. I'm the acting deputy director for NRC's Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research. And it is my privilege to welcome you to RIC and also to especially this afternoon's session, which is on minority serving institutions and their positive impact on the mission of the NRC. This afternoon, we have three institutions that we'll be presenting. Um, and after all the presentations, we'll have a Q&A. We have speakers from New Mexico State University, the University of Notre Dame, and the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez. But before we get started, I'd like to provide some background information. Um, let me start with the history of the University Nuclear Leadership Program, or UNLP. The program started in fiscal year 20, 2009 as the Integrated University Program. The program initially supported educational grants. Then in fiscal year 2020, the program was renamed the University Nuclear Leadership Program. UNLP also supports research projects relevant to the agency mission. Uh, it's funded um, at $16 million annually. and Non-technical research is also considered under the research announcement. For example, projects that would foster the development of innovative community engagement strategies, including incorporation of the principles of equity and environmental justice. The UNLP provides research and development grants along with educational grants to universities or other institutions of higher education. These grants help the agency assess the future landscape of nuclear energy and prepare for upcoming technical challenges. The university-led projects complement the current and future research needs, and also NRC seeks to leverage universities' capabilities through our research and development grants. Since 2009, the NRC has awarded 602 educational grants totaling more than $190 million. 110 grants have been awarded to minority-serving institutions. 176 grants have been to individual faculty members, 151 scholarship grants, 189 fellowship grants, and 86 trade schools and community college scholarship grants. In addition to individual faculty members, the program has supported 5,070 students located in 40 states and Puerto Rico. And since 2020, the NRC has awarded 46 research grants totaling more than $22.7 million to 33 institutions in 25 states. So with that, and without any further delay, I would like to introduce our first speaker um, from the University of New Mexico. Uh, Dr. Ming-Wi Chen is an assistant professor in the Department of Nuclear Engineering at the University of New Mexico. New Mexico. So, Dr. Chen. Okay. Can you hear me? Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, let me see the slides. Okay. So, um, I, I'm Yu Hui Chen. I'm assistant professor of nuclear engineering from University of New Mexico. Um, before getting into the technical parts, uh, let me introduce our university here. So, we are a Hispanic uh, serving institution. Um, we have about 49.9% 40, uh, of our undergraduate students who are Hispanic. And uh, we do have a nuclear engineering department. So, uh, we currently we have nine tenure, tenure track faculty um, uh, here, and then three lecture, uh, two lectures, and then three national lab professors. Uh, and, and for the student enrollments, uh, we have about 100 undergraduate students and then um, uh, about 60 um, graduate students, which including uh, about 35 uh, PhD students, about 20, a uh, little bit more than 20 um, master students. Uh, we are a small department, but we are working all kinds of area here, and uh, we do have a teaching reactor on campus. So uh, the support from NRC is extremely positive to our, our faculty, students, and then the university structure here. So uh, the topic today, which is a multi-phases computation of fluid dynamics simulation for a uh, molten salt spear and then um, aerosol transport. And then next slide. 
So um, before we uh, kind of introduce our team here, so we have uh, um, one postdoc, actually two, and one left us last month, and uh, he actually works on worked for the project that I'm presenting now. Uh, we do have uh, five PhD students, and one uh, well, actually uh, is working on another area right now, so I didn't list here. Uh, we have an uh, um, undergraduate student, and, and then we already graduated two students here. I think the slide here is an older version, so it was not updated. Uh, it's not the same as the one that's uh, showing on the website, but it's okay. Um, so we do have uh, uh, three big research areas. One is the high temperature heat sources. Um, we are working on molten salt reactors and then um, high temperature gas cool reactors uh, and then the micro reactors. We are also working on some other areas, um, including um, fusion reactors and then next generation concentrated solar power. The second one, which is the high temperature heat exchanger. So we are uh, including printed circuit heat exchanger, twisted to tube heat exchanger, and uh, uh, hydric coil heat exchangers. The third big area, which is the thermal energy storage and then advanced power cycles. So we are working on both molten salt based and then particle based thermal energy storage systems. Uh, we are also working on the um, ICO2 power cycle and then uh, free piston storing engines. So uh, next slide. So um, this is the outline of uh, the topic uh, um, and then you can see uh, this is kind of schematic for molten salt reactor. Those components are crucial for the molten salt. And then that, those are one that we are currently working in my lab right now. So uh, we have uh, research going on for the back of the cavity cooling system, molten salt pumps, intermediate heat changing, and then two molten salt tanks for the thermal energy storage, as well as the uh, secondary heat changer, which is from molten salt to a water steam um, uh, generator. And then uh, we're not coming all of them. Uh, we will just talk about one which is more related to safety aspect, or that's one which it's uh, currently supported by NRC, and then um, which is the molten salt spill um, experiment and then simulation work. So uh, we will talk about a little bit of background and motivation, and then move to the multi-phases computational modeling, which in big part will be the uh, CFD, uh, multi-phase CFD simulation, basically. And then we have some conclusions. Uh, next slide. Uh, next. So um, this one is a simplified timeline for molten salt reactor development. So uh, it started an aircraft reactor experiment in 1954. And then in 1965, the MSRE uh, started operation. And then in 1969, the MSRE started operation in, in 90. Uh, 1976, the MSRE program was canceled, and then in 2002, uh, it was selected as one of Generation 4 reactors. And there's a lot of research going on in 2010s, including fluoride salt high temperature reactors, and then this uh, multiple LP project and UP project supporting this effort. And then uh, the result in 2016, uh, Catalyst Power uh, was established. And then 2023, which is last year, um, Kairos Power received an RC permit for the uh, Hermes uh, reactor construction permit. Um, there is uh, not just for one uh, modern salt, there's so many modern salts um, apps. Um, what you can see uh, is basically grouped in two big areas. One is for the thermal reactors, the other one, which is for the fast reactor. For thermal reactor, it could be used uh, solid fuel. Uh, for solid fuel, it could be pr pr um, prismatic tab, or it could be paper bag. So for paper bag, which is kind of powder design, uh, for prismatic, which is our crazy design. Um, then for the liquid fuel, it could be have three in the apps, one is a donor, a converter, or um, um, it's, uh, sorry to see, sorry. So it's breather here, okay? Uh, so why, why modern salts? Um, next slide. Um, so uh, for this table, we list uh, some uh, high temperature heat transform medium and then a property uh, from three column. That, the first three column that you can see uh, like fried salt, chlorous salt, and solo salts. And then the next one, which is high temperature, high pressure helium. And then uh, we have the uh, liquid matter, which is sodium, uh, which includes sodium, um, sodium, potassium, lead, and then bismuth. 
So uh, when we compare all these things that you can see for the pros for molten salt, which is had relatively high boiling points, and then the it's all they also have very high and volumetric heat capacity, which means it potentially could provide a high compact reactor design. And for the sodium, which you know you can see it's had a relatively low melting point and it's a very high uh, thermal conductivity. Um for the uh Atom with high pressure helium, which you can see here, um, it doesn't show any good points here, but then it's inert gas basically. So it is clear, no, no, no clear cut which one is the best. But when we move to the next slide, which you can see, um, we made a drawing of density with the temperature, and that from the left figure, which you can see, only molten salt react and the high temperature gas cool react can operate up to a more than 600 Celsius. From the figure on the Right hand side, which is the allowable stress with different material and then with temperature. So as you can see, after six uh, more than six hundred Celsius, the allowable stress dramatically reduces, which means for the high temperature, high pressure or moderate pressure, it's required advanced metals. And sometimes for advanced metals, it's uh, it's it's you know very challenging, very pressing, and then uh, it's also possible that it's not cold certified. So let's leave the molten salt reactor here. And the takeaway message with it's the molten salt uh, reactor advantage here is it's operating in a very high temperature and then um, low pressure systems. So uh, next slide, which is uh, the molten salt, the topic which is molten salt spill. So this is a, a schematic from the Argonne National Lab with a technical report. And then uh, it's showing there's a bridge from the molten salt primary loop. As you can see, there's um, uh, the job bridge from the um, from the bridge uh, from the primary loop, and uh, you can see molten salt actually impinging on the catch pan, and then the main stream go down to the drain tank. And along the way, it's had flow, it's spreading, and then it's due to the impinging, it's also spreading. Uh, it's had vaporization as well as the heat transfer, um, or radiation heat transfer. Then from the expression, it had a bubble um, formation, bubble bursting, which generates aerosol, gen um, generate aerosols, and then you have also bubbles that evaporate or condense on the contaminants. Um, so we wanted to study this, uh, you know, the phenomena showing here, and uh, which actually, uh, next slide. It's very important because the NRC licensing is required for some postulated scenario analysis and validation. And which in the molten salts um, severe accident is it's, it's uh, unlikely, but then uh, it's uh, primarily candidate for bond events. So we need some information like the spear salt flow, spreading heat transfer, and then some other information. So they actually the data that it's, they are required um, by the vendors to prepare the licensing um, process. And then the data also required for again and then advanced model developments. So some concerns for the molten salt spill, which you can see they're all listed here. So radioactive material depend from fuel salt due to spreading and spreading. Salt in contact with atmosphere may result in radio um, vaporization from the chemical reaction, salts on the concrete, which you know, degrade the concrete. Uh, then the salt may also compromise the catch pan, which you know, called the catch pan deformation or you know, also collisions and you know, potentially will lead to the leakage. And then salt, fuel salt can also pose a critical risk also. So those that we can find from the uh, Dr. Bukham's uh, um, technical report in the reference. Uh, next slide. So some thing that uh, some 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 phenomena or um, you no know, uh, scenario can cause the salt uh, spear. One is you no, know, it's required a salt. You no know, salt it may get freezing or remelting in the primary loop, and then it's causing stress stress on different components, uh, which potentially can cause damage to the uh, uh, the components, which you no know, ultimately lead to salt leakage from the primary. Uh, salt drain analysis also is required for the spill because as you can see it's you know, basically that the salt actually flow down to the drain pan. And then um, uh, you know those some something at least here like the um uh actually cooling system may cause the salt freezing and then previous you know, the external power supply uh if it's done then 
and also causing uh, fluid zone issues. So uh, next slide. Some result that is showing here, uh, which you can, it's um, the left figure showing us uh, the uh, system that we are modeling. So we uh, use uh, use Berkeley's uh, FHR design. So we have a reactor that you can see on the figure A here. And then we have uh, the cavity, and then we have catch pan, and then we have uh, the jet tank here. Uh, B figure, and then figure B, figure C, it is showing the machines, scene that you see here. Uh, the right hand side, which is the initial result that we got from the simulation. So the top one, which is the velocity, and then the bottom one, which is showing the temperature. So we're going to show the more detailed information later on. So next slide. Um, so to get the initial um, flow rate boundary, so we use the analytic solution uh, calculation to get the velocity that from the giant hole. So we you know the figure show uh, which is the, um, uh, the 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 figure A which shows the fluid height in the reactor, so the um, the molten salt level in the reactor with, with the time when there's a jam. And then uh, the figure B shows here, which is the outlet velocity versus the time. So as you can see the uh, initial velocity, which is the four meter per second, and then some other velocity, and then the um, the flow rates, as you also you can see on the two uh, bottom two figures. Uh, left hand show you all the equations for calculation. So there's the one assumption that for each time step should be larger than the uh, momentum uh, time scale that we are using in the CFD. And then for each time step, we assume it's in steady operation so that we can get the solutions here. It's the ODE equation, which is um, equation number uh, number six. So you can uh, we can do the calculation from it. Okay, next slide. So as I just mentioned, so more result I can shown in this one. So the top left uh, uh, figures that you show here, uh, it's uh, it, it's showing the flow rate source uh, volume from zero to one, and uh, you, can, you can we can only see the the bulk effect. So um, the initial step you can see there's a little bit of salt going from the hole, and then there's a salt actually impinging on the uh, catch pan, and then you go down to the um, last the two step that you can see the salt actually go um, along the catch pan. Impinging on the uh, the um, drain hole, and then uh, it's causing the um, some splashings also there, which will potentially lead to more you know, uh, salt actually generally um, you know, appears at that region. Uh, the bottom eight figures actually show the um, the salt uh, fraction from zero to five percent, and actually you can see more detailed salt vaporization or aerosol potentially aerosol yields. So um, for the last two steps that you can see, um, it's uh, basically starts to go all, all the way into the um, cavity systems. The figures show you on the right hand side, which is the velocity profile. And then uh, you can see these um, the results flow down from the hole and then impinging on the catch pan. And actually from the left, um, figure, you can see there's some little bit of salt go through on the top side and go to the, um, the left of wall of the cavity side and then uh, you also can notice by the two exits they also have the uh, salt components shown uh the bottom ones these will be the streamline from the salt um, flow so it's basically it's showing very complicated uh, flow um, behaviors and the next slide please so uh, this will be the um, uh, simulation based on the using the particles so we have more Micro um, particles side, and then uh, we using the like la larger methodology instead of the Euro um, methodology. So uh, it's actually you can see from different time step. The top fig eight figures shows the um, top view, uh, and then, then the um, bottom eight figures actually show the um, front view of the um, particles. So you can see the particles, which basically solid particles go all around the um, the cavity. We haven't finished all the testing because it takes so much longer. It's This year actually is three months at calculation average with about um, 40 million sales. So we continue running our, um, our simulation so we can get more results here. Um, what you can see here, the um, the brown dot, which actually it's, uh, it's fixed on the 
uh, catch pain or the uh, surface. And then the blue one, which actually is free. So it's basically it's free all around to the uh, cavity there. Uh, the you know, takeaway message here is so we if this for molten salts with um, few uh, fish, fishing products is potentially with you no know, go all the cavity under the um, um, the uh, molten salts and the um, supporting structures. Yeah. So um, I think this is the last slide, and then the next one will be reference, and then uh, next one with so thank you. I think it turns out right. Thank you, Dr. Chen. And I see that there are a few questions for you, but as I said earlier, we're going to hold the questions until all uh, three institutions have um, provided their presentation. Uh, so our okay. next set of speakers. I'm sorry, did someone? <laughs> so our, ne our next set of speakers are from the University of Notre Dame, um, who did work with the um, uh, New Mexico State University. So, so we have Yaya Kurama, who is a professor of structural engineering in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Earth Sciences at the University of Notre Dame. We also have Dr. Craig Knudson, who is a professor and department head in the Civil Engineering Department at, the, at New Mexico State University. Thank you, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we regret that we're unable to be there in person, but uh, we're very pleased to present about our research project funded by the NRC, uh, which is on a new type of modularized construction method for reinforced concrete nuclear building structures. Uh, I am Yaya Krama from University of Notre Dame, and I serve as the principal investigator um, together with my co-principal investigators, um, and I'm at, at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, our team includes a diverse group of researchers from both Notre Dame and New Mexico State University. And in this presentation, we'll be discussing how this collaboration has greatly benefited uh, not just the technical and educational outcomes from this project, but also strengthened uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the primary goal of our research is to improve construction schedules and construction conditions uh, for safety-related reinforced concrete nuclear building structures. Uh, and we're going to do that by allowing large building modules to be constructed away from the building site uh, and then moved and efficiently connected on site. Uh, the most critical locations of a modularized structure are the connections between the modules. These need to provide full strength and stiffness continuity without compromising thermal and radiation shielding. Uh, modularized construction methods have been developed and deployed for steel nuclear building structures. Um, you can see an example on the bottom left image. Uh, and we have um, modularization techniques also av available for non-nuclear reinforced concrete building structures, as you can see on the bottom right image. Uh, however, uh, reinforced concrete module connections suitable for the extreme low demands uh, in safety-related nuclear building designs currently do not exist. So our project is aiming to address this knowledge gap. Next slide, please. So in this project, we're focusing on the modularization of reinforced concrete shear walls. Uh, these are the most common structural components in a nuclear building infrastructure. Uh, you can see them depicted in till color in the image on the top left. Uh, shear walls are also the most critical components for the structural and shielding integrity of nuclear buildings. Um, as shown on the top right image for the plan view of a perimeter shear wall at the corner of a nuclear building, our modularization concept uses a lab connection with a nonlinear or Z-shaped grouted construction tolerance joint in between the modules. Uh, the two sides of the connection are clamped together using external steel plates with grouted bolts through the wall thickness with no welding necessary to complete the connection. As compared with end-to-end -end or bot connections used in non-nuclear uh, modularized reinforced concrete structures, the lab connection with its nonlinear geometry provides superior mechanical and shielding integrity between the modules. And in the bottom image, images, we're showing how a nuclear building perimeter can be closed rapidly by lapping prefabricated shear modules one after another. Next slide, please. Um, our project team that contributed to the material in this presentation includes four senior res researchers, myself and Dr. Brad Walden, serve as co-PIs at Notre Dame. Dr. Mark Manning, who was a research scientist at Notre Dame uh, in the first year of the project, recently moved to Los Alamos National Laboratory 
and Professor Newton is the co-PI at New Mexico State University, and he will be delivering a portion of this presentation at the middle. Next slide, please. Um, we're also in this project collaborating with Dr. Subhash Shinde and Barbara Villarosa of the Notre Dame Center for Sustainable Energy. They've been providing technical and administrative support for the research, uh, and the energy is also providing funding opportunities for underrepresented undergraduate students to work as summer interns at Notre Dame through the Vincent P. Slatt Fellowship. Next slide, please. Um, this project has so far also included three civil engineering undergraduates at Notre Dame and three civil engineering undergraduates at New Mexico State University, both focusing or all focusing on structural engineering. Four of these students have been from underrepresented groups. Uh, and now I'll pass the presentation over to Dr. Newson. He's going to talk about how our collaborative research has benefited diversity and inclusion while advancing the modularization of nuclear reinforced concrete building construction. Next slide, please. So the next portion of this presentation, we'll talk about collaboration and specifically how this has benefited diversity and inclusion and vice versa. And as Gino stated, we've got a, a two universities uh, participating in this project, the University of Notre Dame and New Mexico State University. Next slide, please. So both universities have diversity, equity, and inclusion programs um, at Notre Dame. The university statement is that they want to foster a culture of belonging and collaboration and enhance student enrichment, leadership, and career development. NMSU has a similar program uh, and states that they want to foster community and inclusive, and inclusive excellence and create collaborative and cohesive partnerships that will achieve socially just climate and a sense of belonging for our students. Next slide, please. So NMSU is a land grant and Hispanic serving institution. As a Hispanic serving institution, we must have at least 25% of our, of our enrollment be Hispanic students. And at least 50% of our students need to qualify for needs-based Title IV aid. Um, if you look at the table here for university enrollment by ethnicity, what you'll see is that NMSU actually has 57.6% Hispanic enrollment, so more than double the requirement. Um, and if you looked at our total enrollment for minorities, what you would see is that we're above 60%. So everything is good in terms of reaching a diverse group at New Mexico State University. Next slide, please. Within the College of Engineering, um, things get a little bit Things change a little bit, but in terms of ethnicity, still quite good, still 55% plus on Hispanic enrollment and still about 60% for minorities as a whole. Um, where we start to see a gap is on female participation or female enrollment. And what we see is that women are very much underrepresented in engineering. So we're looking at 24.4% in engineering or women. Um, and this is pretty representative of what happens nationally. Um, next slide, please. Within the Department of Civil Engineering, which is the group within NMSU that is actually participating in this NRC project, we're still about 55% Hispanic enrollment at 56.3%, still about 60% enrollment for minorities as a whole. And we do a little bit better with female enrollment, we're at 33.9%. Um, so we're, we're able to draw a little bit better from our women students. Um, and the whole idea here is to, is to get these up underrepresented students interested in things that are related to the nuclear industry, career paths specifically that are related to the nuclear industry. So if we look back at our reasonably recent graduates. Uh, we have two former students who have spent time working on the National Enrichment Facility, which is in eastern New Mexico. And currently we have a student that's in our graduating semester who has interned with Palo Verde Nuclear Generating Station in the Phoenix area and is uh, looking to accept a permanent position with them. Next slide, please. 
uh, for the students that we've got in our program right now that have participated in this research project. The first is Omar Munoz. Uh, he is the one uh, semi-facing us in the, in the photograph. Um, he was funded by a SLAT fellowship at Notre Dame to spend 10 weeks last summer. And the project that he worked on during those 10 weeks was a 3D animation to illustrate the, constru the construction sequence of the modular building. Um, at NMSU, we also have Irina Plaxina, who is, she started working on the, the laboratory research at NMSU during her last semester of her bachelor's degree. Currently, she is a master's student in structural engineering, and she's basically doing the, the thermal expansion measurements um, for the grout and concrete materials that are used in the construction. Uh, also doing some other material materials characterization testing. And then our third student here is Urban Ron Keogh. He is another undergraduate. He was hired to help Irina Plexina with her uh, testing in the laboratory. And his funding actually came from the Alliance for Minority Participation, which is a, an NSF grant aimed at uh, getting minority students involved in research projects. And it is used to complement uh, research projects throughout the state of New Mexico. It's not specific to NMSU, although the the center is housed at New Mexico State University. Slide, please. So the research that we're doing in the in the laboratory at NMSU is related to the concrete and grout materials. So in the top table, you see the the concrete mix design. This was a mixed design that was developed under a previous Department of Energy project at Notre Dame. Um, when we went back and looked at their mixed designs, this is the one that we liked. So we decided to run this one for this particular project. Uh, we're also looking at two grouts that will be used in the grouted connections between the modules. And both of these products that we're looking at are produced by master builders. Next slide, please. So, doing some basic materials characterization like compressive strength, but really the big part of the research is postulating that there, there could be a, a high temperature event, a ruptured pipe of some sort, uh, anything along those lines. So we're looking at how the concrete and the grout and specifically that connection between modules will perform under high temperatures. So in terms of the materials characterization, we're looking at coefficient of thermal expansion measurements and going up to about 600 degrees centigrade. And to do that, we're using the furnace and a measurement technique called digital image correlation. Um, we're also looking at shrinkage, bond strength between the grout and the concrete, basically anything that would affect the integrity of that grouted joint. Um, and then the last part of the project, we'll have some modeling for thermal degradation of the joint. Next slide, please. So out of the work that we've done so far um, in the second column of this top table, you'll see the, the two grouts, the 4316 grout, the 928 grout, and the concrete. And what we're doing is looking at coefficients of thermal expansion for these materials. So when you go to the right column, you'll see the coefficient of thermal expansion values. And the grouts have a little bit higher coefficient of thermal expansion than the, than the concrete, but everything is is reasonably close. So things are looking at least a little promising there. Next slide, please. And then the, the last slide that I'm going to talk about here is the poster that Omar Munoz put together for his SLAT fellowship last summer. Um, although the, the, the text is too small, what you see are the images from his 3D animation of the construction sequence showing how the, how the structure is put together. Next slide, please. And Gina will finish this presentation. All right, thanks, Craig. Um, so in this last section of our presentation, I'll be discussing how our collaborative project has benefited the education and training of the entire research team, as well as the research outcomes from our project. Uh, the photos here show our research group casting some of the modular reinforced concrete specimens that were tested at Notre Dame, which I'll be discussing in more detail. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, in terms of education and training, our project team included undergraduates, a research scientist, and faculty advisors, and this allowed participants with different levels of education and experience uh, to interact and learn from each other. Uh, this interaction resulted in the professional development of the entire team in not only the technical aspects of the research, but also on project management, networking, and mentorship. Uh, the photographs on this slide show additional images of our test specimens being constructed, including concrete finishing, material sampling, and uh, clamping of connection bolts using a calibrated torque wrench. Next slide, please. Uh, in our research, we're using an integrated process that is based on sound design, laboratory testing, modeling, analysis, and evaluation. Uh, this process starts by initial conceptualization supported by 3D printing and computer visualization and subsequent prototype design and development for our modular laboratory specimens. A state of practice, non-modular companion specimens are also designed, tested, and analyzed for benchmarking purposes. Uh, for our first two series of specimens tested uh, to date, we considered horizontal slices taken out of a shear wall in a nuclear building as depicted on the top left image. These specimens were fabricated in our laboratory at quarter length scale and then subjected to mechanical load testing as well as materials evaluation. Analysis and comparison of the test data against numerical model and design predictions led to the validation of our design, construction, and analysis approaches and techniques. Ultimately, this integrated approach also provided excellent opportunities for the education and training of our researchers who worked on these tasks. Next slide, please. These photographs show further details about our modular construction technique. Counterclockwise from top left, the images show our forms and reinforcement, cast modular components, grouting of the tolerance joint and cure joint prior to placement and clamping of the external connection plates. Next slide, please. Here's a 10 second video, if you can play that video, please, um, of one of our tests at 100 times the actual speed on the left hand side. Um, this specimen was tested as a simply supported beam with concentrated loading immediately to the right of the connection, creating highly shear critical loading conditions on the connection. The performance of the specimen demonstrated the ability of the connection to provide full mechanical stiffness and strength continuity between the modules with ultimate failure developing outside of the connection and no significant damage in the connection region as designed. Next slide, please. Um, our learning process in this project included testing uh, of a total of 12 specimens to date, analyzing a number of key design variables for the connections, including reinforcement, grout strength, clamping force, and steel-to-steel -steel surface conditions. This resulted in the successful validation of design of materials, clamping, and reinforcement details, as well as continuum finite element models with their predictions as shown on the right-hand side. Next slide, please. So looking at a summary of our presentation, uh, this project has been providing relevant and wide-ranging research experiences for technical staff and students from gender and ethnically diverse backgrounds. Our multi-institution collaboration, including a minority-serving university, has been pro promoting access and opportunities for underrepresented students, and these students are being exposed to potential career paths in the nuclear industry. Uh, the research tasks conducted to date have also demonstrated that our novel lab connection will allow safe modularization, reducing costs, and improving construction efficiency for the next generation nuclear power plants. Next slide, please. Um, our acknowledgments are to the NRC for providing this funding and NRC staff for administering this project, as well as to ND Energy and material donors for our research. Next slide, please. With that, I'd like to conclude our presentation and we'll be very happy to answer questions at the very end. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Kurama and Dr. Knudsen. Uh, again, I'd like to remind everyone that if you'd like to ask a question, you can use the QR code or you can also use the submit question um, if you are participating online, you can, can, you can use that feature. Um, our, next, our next set of speakers are from the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez. Uh, we have Professor Silvina Cancelos, who is an assistant professor in mechanical engineering at the University of Puerto Rico. Ms. Desiree Rivera Borges, a senior undergraduate student at the University of Puerto Rico who majors in chemical engineering. We also have Robert Roche Rivera, who is a program manager at the, University, at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and is currently serving as an adjunct professor at the University of Puerto Rico. And Mr. Marcos Rolon Acevedo, who is uh, 
a structural engineer at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research, and he is also an adjunct professor at the University of Puerto Rico. So with that, I'll turn over to Ms. Cancelos. Thank you, Marisa, for the introduction. Uh, I first would like to uh, go over the next, uh, next slide, please. So I, I would like first to go over a quick overview over the College of Engineering, so you know uh, how it's our university. So next slide, please. So I'd like to say that we are proud of our program's accreditation history. For example, Mechanical Engineering, that's my department since the 1960s. It has been accredited by AVET, and we were able to manage that accreditation throughout the years. Uh, the same thing with the other uh, engineering programs. So next slide, please. So just to give you an idea of our numbers uh, provided by the American Society for Engineering Education, we are very well ranked in terms of undergraduate enrollment. We are 31st on that. Uh, we are also uh, well ranked in the total uh, degrees uh, worthy to chemical engineers. It's, it's, uh, our position is 21, industrial engineering 24, electrical engineering 31, and computer engineering 49. And I would like to uh, just highlight that uh, in 2021, that's when this uh, study was done, uh, we uh, were number 11 in the amount of PhD degrees awarded to women. So next slide, please. Uh, in total, for the fall 2023, we had 4,907 students enrolled in, another, in uh, our engineering programs. That represents 46% of the total UPRM enrollment, and 27 of those were female, and 257 were graduate students. So next slide, please. Also, uh, we have a very good placement of statistics. 81% of our uh, undergraduate students, they have a job by the time of graduation and 92% after six months of graduation. Uh, there is a, a very small variation between different uh, engineering programs. Next slide, please. This uh, slide shows um, uh, an idea of our funding sources both federal and local government. So we have funding from uh, NASA, NIH, and of course there it's uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And that's uh, uh, what's making us grow in terms of nuclear engineering. So next slide, please. And this slide shows the corporate funding sources. And among those, uh, we can see uh, Dominion uh, that has a nuclear power plant. And also we have the nuclear and Naval Nuclear Labs and Sandia National Labs to highlight from this list. And let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, these are uh, the companies that are hiring our students. So the, the ones that are taking most of our students are in the aerospace industry. However, we are seeing a growth in nuclear-related uh, topics as well. We see NAPC there, we see Southern Company, we see Georgia Power, Dominion Energy, that are also hiring a lot of our uh, students. So go to next slide, please. And uh, I wanted to highlight that uh, the UPRM has a history in nuclear that started in the 1960s with BONUS. BONUS, a boiling nuclear superheater reactor, uh, started its construction in 1964 and it operated until 1968. It was just to test the concept. After that, it was the commission, and most of the high-level waste was uh, transported to the mainland. Uh, also in the 1970s, Puerto Rico had a nuclear center uh, that uh, the University of Puerto Rico, Maya West, had two uh, nuclear reactors, a bigger nuclear reactor and an L-77 uh, training reactor, uh, along with the masters in nuclear engineering. So all that uh, ended in the 80s uh, with the decommissioning of the nuclear reactor and all educational activities in nuclear uh, just as uh, weren't provided anymore by the university. That happened until 2006 when um, several professors of the university decided to start providing education in nuclear engineering topics and they created uh, series of courses to provide the students with that knowledge. 
Uh, that was very successful, but unfortunately that lasted only for a couple of years because we had some uh, difficulties, uh, financial difficulties at the university that did not allow us to continue with that. But uh, and then in 2019, things started changing, specifically after Hurricane Maria, when we had a very strong uh, uh, electricity crisis, really. We were four months without energy. And so younger generations started seeing nuclear power as an alternative. And so there was a nuclear alternative project, a group of Puerto Ricans that uh, decided to do a study uh, on the applicability or the possibility of having nuclear reactors in the island. They started giving seminars a lot, uh, I mean, across the island. And the students from the University of Puerto Rico felt motivated by them. And they decided to um, create an ANS chapter at the university. And that all happened in 2019, along with several fellowship grants provided by NRC that made our uh, graduate student population to start working on research projects related to nuclear. So let's move to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to highlight some of our student achievements, uh, thanks to the funding from the NRC. And let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, for example, presentations were given at the NAA conference in 2023, at the ANS conference uh, as well. We also presented at the American Association of Radon Scientists and Technologists in 2023. That was an effort uh, with EPA that we started working on measure, measuring radon in Puerto Rico. Uh, we are also going to present the manuscripts were accepted for the Thermal and Fluid Engineering Conference uh, in April this year. And the also uh, uh, manuscripts were accepted for the ANS conference in, in during this summer and a poster for the West Management Symposium in 2024. So in this slide, some of the pictures of our students presented are, are shown. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, some of our uh, NRC fellows uh, are William Rios, he's here with me in this room, Juan Perez, he's also here, Andres Gonzalez, he uh, graduated with the master's uh, and he was funded by NRC. He's currently working at GE Vernova uh, in the nuclear part of the company. Uh, Christian Ramos, he's working also, um, uh, he's doing a master's uh, with us in, me in mechanical engineering funded by the NRC. And he's working on a means to uh, remove rape from homes uh, by, he's right now making DNS modeling of, uh, uh, he's trying to see how radon is diffusing inside the room when you have ventilation and you also have some uh, parts of the room where you have um, uh, filtration systems to remove radon. And then uh, Rafael, uh, Rafael is doing a PhD in mechanical engineering. Uh, he is uh, here also in this room. And I think I skipped one uh, who got a master's in mechanical engineering uh, being funded by the NRC and is now doing a PhD in mechanical engineering. So let's go to the next slide, please. This slide is a compendium of everything the students are working on uh, at the graduate level. So the video is showing bubbles on molten salt. That was a mixture of uh, potassium chloride and sodium chloride, and the bubbles were produced by electrolysis. Uh, so we were funded by the Department of Energy uh, in order to build um, a facility to visualize bubbles uh, being formed in molten salts. Uh, so Rafael is working on that. And then Andres uh, was um, working also with molten salts, trying to obtain the um, boiling curve for the uh, potassium chloride, sodium chloride eutectic. Uh, in this uh, slide, we can also see at the top uh, left a uh, result of a modeling that William is doing. William is a master's student. Uh, he is trying to design a neutron detector that has the capability to determine the direction in which the neutrons are uh, coming from. And then we see at the bottom left uh, an image of the simulations uh, that are being conducted by Christian. Uh, that uh, picture shows the concentration of radon in a room where you have on the left at the center a small window and on the right at the top another window, so air is moving uh, through the 
through the room. Uh, however, there's still a uh, high spots, high spots of concentration uh, close to the floor uh, due to the poor ventilation in that in that part. So let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, I just also wanted to add that thanks to all the initiatives that are uh, happening at the university right now, uh, we are having more industries uh, coming in that, that are for the nuclear sector that are coming to recruit. So last year, for example, we had NPR. That was the first time we, we had them here. And Urano contacted us because they wanted to um, have internships with our students. So next, let's go to the next slide. And I think that now I have to pass it over to the CIRE. Uh, she is with the American Nuclear Society chapter at the UPRL. Thank you very much, Silvina. I'm Desiree. I'm one of the co-founders of the American Nuclear Society student section here at the University of Puerto Rico. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so our student section's mission is to increase interest and understanding in nuclear science within the Puerto Rican community. And our vision is to become trustworthy, credible advocates within Puerto Rico. Our student section was founded in November 2019, roughly two years after uh, Hurricane Maria left the island, uh, mostly without electrical power for several months. And a couple of months after a particularly inspiring seminar offered by the Nuclear Alternative Project to which several students from the university attended. Uh, after this seminar, we were inspired to start the student section and become active within the nuclear industry. Uh, our student section has grown significantly over the, the last five years. We are currently recognized as a, at a national level as one of the largest and most active uh, student sections. We were awarded the Samuel Gladstone Award in 2021 and 2022, which is given to the most uh, successful or outstanding student section out of over 60 sections at a national level. And we were again awarded the second place of this award in 2023. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a pretty varied membership. As of January 2023, we have a little over 80 members, out of which 70% are male and 30% are female. I believe that last year we had uh, up to 46% of our members were female. So we have had a lot of variation, but definitely some very successful results within that. Um, a little over 98% of our students identify as Hispanic or Latino, and a little over 73% are enrolled in engineering, pri primarily uh, chemical engineering. Um, students are juniors and seniors, but we do have a couple of projects going on to try to uh, get more freshmen uh, involved within the organization. And we do track our members' interest. We have seen that most students are interested, particularly in nuclear fusion and nuclear fission. But we have seen students interested in many different applications across the board. Next slide, please. I'd like to talk a little bit about a couple of the most important programs and projects that we have going on right now. Uh, we have the K-12 Nuclear School Visitation Program. This was started by our students in 2020. Um, we have impacted over 460 students with our school workshops. So we'll go to schools, bring educational workshops regarding nuclear sciences to teach children about these topics that are normally not covered in uh, Puerto Rican school science curriculums. We have the Nuclear Engineering Curricular Sequence Project, which was basically just um, the students from the organization getting together to request the university to start bringing back all of those nuclear engineering courses that were once given uh, roughly in the 70s. Uh, um, so currently the university is providing uh, two different nuclear engineering courses as electives. Uh, those have been provided by uh, Robert and Marcos, which we'll be talking a little bit more about that later on. And currently over 90 students here at the UPRM have been impacted by this project. And lastly, we have the Puerto Rico Nuclear History Awareness Program. As Dr. Silvina Cancelos mentioned earlier, Puerto Rico has a huge and very impactful a nuclear history that's very rich and a lot of people don't know about it, including the nuclear reactors at Bonas in Rincón and here within the university. So we just kind of want to raise awareness to people, let them know that Puerto Rico has a history here. 
Uh, so far, over 55 people have been impacted by our visit to the boiling nuclear super, uh, superheater reactor located in Rigo. Next slide, please. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about the NRC contributions to these student-driven efforts, uh, mostly through the, making nuclear engineering education a little bit more accessible by providing resources to conduct pilot nuclear engineering classes and providing technical seminars from NRC industry professionals at our university that has greatly benefited the student body and ANS members. Um, also nuclear industry, minority inclusion and growth we have seen not just the NRC, but a lot of companies in the nuclear industry in general bringing more career opportunities, including internships, early career programs, full-time opportunities, uh, fellowships, research support, and so much more to the university, particularly over the last years. And by increasing nuclear visibility in Puerto Rico, uh, primarily from the key visit from the NRC's chair, Christopher T. Hansen, he came to the university, I believe it was about a year and a half ago, where we had a meeting with the university's dean and faculty, as well as some of the students and more active members of the community to talk about how we can uh, start including more minorities, specifically women and uh, people of Hispanic descent within these initiatives. Next slide, please. And lastly, I'd like to delve a little bit into some student surveys we have conducted. Uh, our section definitely tracks student interest in different areas of uh, nuclear engineering, particularly their likelihood to enroll in specific nuclear engineering courses or within a nuclear engineering uh, curricular sequence at the university. So far, we have had uh, amazing results. There's definitely a significant amount of students interested. We have uh, conducted these surveys serve for about the last three or four years and we have identified consistently that each semester we have at least a hundred students that are interested in enrolling in, in a regular sequence in nuclear sciences. Um, next slide please. I'd like to turn it over now to Marcos and Robert which will be talking a little bit more about the nuclear engineering curriculum at the University of Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you Desiree. We are excited to be here today to discuss the ongoing developments and plans for the nuclear engineering curriculum at the UPRM. The NRC and UPRM partnered to form a nuclear engineering curriculum at the university. My colleague Robert Roche Rivera and I were appointed to serve as adjunct professors starting in the fall semester of 2023. Our participation in this position was facilitated through a rotation in SBCR, the Office of Small Business and Civil Rights. And I'm proud to say that both our home Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research and SBCR have played instrumental roles in supporting the efforts at UPRM. And we are very grateful for the opportunity to serve in this capacity. Next slide, please. In the fall of 2023, we offered two courses on the subjects of fundamentals of nuclear science and engineering and nuclear power plant engineering. The courses were delivered in a hybrid format with 29 and 13 students enrolled in each course and the combined enrollment of these courses increased during the spring semester. We find this to be an excellent sign of the growing interest in nuclear engineering among students at UPRM. We also worked on some exciting activities to further engage the students at UPRM and provide them with valuable learning experiences. One of these activities was a seminar for the ANS student section entitled Nuclear Reactors 101, which was very well received. Students also had the opportunity to go on a field trip to Bonus, the, the commissioned boiling nuclear superheated reactor site in Rincón, Puerto Rico. Additionally, as part of the recruiting efforts in our agency, we welcomed NRC staff to both of our classes who delivered an orientation about the job opportunities available at the NRC. The participation in the courses and supporting activities 
have shown great promise and we are excited to see how this effort continues to grow and develop. And with this, I'll turn it over to Robert to continue the presentation. Thank you, Marcos. And if we could uh, go to the next slide, please. So this semester, uh, Marcos and I have uh, continued teaching uh, the two courses that Marcos highlighted in, in the previous slide. Uh, we've also been enhancing the course materials based on last semester's experience. And in collaboration uh, with Professor Silvina, uh, today with us in the presentation, um, as well as Professor Gustavo Gutierrez, we've taken steps towards uh, including these courses in the university catalog. Um, regarding our main goal uh, of the current effort, which is to uh, develop a, a minor in nuclear engineering at UPRM, uh, so toward this end, We've collaborated with, like I said a moment ago, with Professor Silvina and Professor Gustavo Gutierrez uh, on the proposal for the nuclear engineering minor, and which is about to be entered into the formal review process at UPRM. And what we're seeing is a lot of excitement and interest at the university from both the faculty members and the students, and it just seems that this is the opportune moment uh, for the nuclear engineering minor to flourish and to thrive at UPRM. Um, in summary, so as discussed throughout the presentation, uh, the NRC and UPRM have had a relationship over several years. Uh, the presentation also showcased uh, the positive impact of such relationship uh, on the student body and the resulting fruits and contributions uh, back to the nuclear engineering field. So more recently, uh, that relationship has been strengthened uh, via the SBCR's Minority Service Institutions Program, which has provided the opportunity for both Marcos and, and me to serve as adjunct professors at the university. And this arrangement continues to position UPRM as a direct diversity pipeline of highly qualified individuals, not only for NRC, but also for industry. Uh, the presentation also highlighted uh, the bonus reactor site, of which you can see a picture here on this slide. And, and really, that, that that structure that you see there really serves as a testament of the nuclear history in Puerto Rico and an inspiration of future endeavors at UPRM. Uh, with that, I would like to say on behalf of Professor Silvina and other faculty members, Desiree, Mariana, Marcos, and me, uh, we wanna say thank you to the NRC, thank you to SBCR's Minority Serving Institutions Program for making this opportunity possible, and thank you all for your attention. So thank you, uh, Professor Cancelos, uh, Ms. Borges, Mr. Uh, Rivera, and Mr. Acevedo for the presentation. And, and before we get to the questions, please let's give all of the speakers uh, a hand for, for the very good presentations. So we've got plenty of time for questions, um, and so, so keep them coming. Uh, we, we have actually a, a, a number of questions, and, and let me go ahead and and get started. Um, so this first question is um, for everyone. Um, so you know, whoever wants to, to jump in. Um, how does the NRC sponsored grant research, how does the, the NRC sponsored grant research, oh my gosh, may have affected your student's interest in a career at the NRC or in, an, in, in the industry in general? So how, how has the program affected your students' interest in a career in nuclear? Anybody want to go first? I, I'll volunteer to go first, okay. if that's all right. Sure. Um, I, I would say at New Mexico State, because we're in civil engineering, the exposure that students receive typically to the nuclear industry is minimal, very close to zero. So having an opportunity to work with the NRC has been tremendous. Um, Every student that has worked on our projects sees infinitely more of the of the nuclear industry than they did before. So, it, it, in my case specifically at, at New Mexico State University, it, it's it's a profound difference. Thank you. Does anybody else want to answer that? Hey, I, I, I would like to to say something about that too. Uh, for our university, the impact of the NRC fellowship has been tremendous. 
I think that the, our students doing research in nuclear related topics has been motivated other undergraduate research, uh, under, uh, undergraduate students to also want to do research in nuclear, to uh, come to me and ask me about uh, possible jobs in the nuclear industry. Uh, I've seen students that have taken the courses uh, uh, that Marcos and Robert have been teaching that they had opportunities then to go to the industry and work. And then I, I, I have seen people that come and tell me that, that what we are doing has had a, a, a tremendous impact uh, because they see the difference in the, in the students. They see how now they have that huge motivation to go and work for these industries. And, and also, it, it's like all, it's all, everything is important. I mean, if, if we tagger only a curricular development uh, without doing research, uh, it, it doesn't have the same impact. When the undergrad students see uh, graduate fellows working and they see the labs and they see how, uh, I mean, they, they, they see what they do and they feel more motivated to go for nuclear. So I, I think that everything together uh, has a tremendous impact, but the NRC fellowships are crucial because that's what's showing the rest what can be done. Uh, so I, I really appreciate the the help that you have given us, uh, it could have been impossible otherwise. Thank you. Okay. The I, I, can, I can go next. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Chen. Yeah, so um, so as I just mentioned during my talk, so the NRC grant actually had a uh, tremendously positive effects on our students here. Um, first one will be the financial support. So uh, we do have the uh, NRC scholarship and the fellowship. And um, those are we actually covering the tuition office and then a uh, living expense for students so they can stay in nuclear field. Uh, also, uh, as a uh, you know, and um, uh, research you know, uh, grants, it's providing research opportunity for both graduate students as well as undergraduate students. So students can get hands-on experience uh, under this uh, supported project. Uh, the next one, you know, certainly a student can you know, do, doing some experiments, you know, do research work, and they have some published work, so they can go uh, conferences, so they can get more like professional developments. And then uh, later on, actually, you now it's very you know, excellent for the uh, career advancements because they, um, you know, they learn all these skills and you know, knowledge, and um, you know, these will help them certainly to. Um, no, do you actually refer to job in the nuclear engine? So those are the things that I just, I, I just kind of very simplified. Thank you. I, I can add a few comments about Notre Dame also, the impact at Notre Dame if uh, we have time. Sure. Um, so, it, yeah, I, I am in the civil engineering department as well, and we don't have a, a um, nuclear engineering department in, in the College of Engineering at Notre Dame. So our students are normally not exposed to nuclear infrastructure, nuclear design at all. Uh, but I do teach a reinforced concrete design class to our juniors. And uh, usually in that class, I bring examples of my research projects. And this one in particular uh, piques their interest quite a bit because they can see the impact that they can make to the nuclear energy field um, and the needs of that field, especially in terms of the huge construction costs, um, for them to see that uh, you don't need to be a materials engineer or a, or, or a scientist to actually contribute to our mission of making nuclear energy uh, safer and uh, um, less expensive. Um, they, they, they can see that, and that makes a huge impact. Thank you. Thank you for all those responses. Um, let's, let's move on to the next question, which is for Dr. Chen. Um, are you tracking how well your minority students are adjusting to corporate America? If yes, what are some of the challenges your minority students have faced in corporate America, and how did your school address these challenges? Hey, can, you, can you see that the question again? Sorry about that. Sure. Um, basically, are, are you tracking how well your minority students are adjusting to corporate America? Um, and if yes, can you talk about some of those challenges and how your school might have addressed it to prepare them for those challenges? So uh, we, I, well, I my answer is we typically don't check uh, that parts. Um, it's, it, this is actually the uh, 
fourth year or fifth year uh, in my career here, and then uh, this is the second year for the project. So, um, I we we don't. So we don't. Okay. Short answer is we we don't. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the, the next question is for you, Dr. Knudsen, because um, you, you talked about um, the, the women still being underrepresented in, in your engineering program. Uh, what efforts do you have in place to, to generate more interest um, amongst women uh, for, to enter into the engineering program? We recruit heavily, um, and it's, it's not specific to to women, uh, we recruit across our community, really, uh, southern New Mexico and, and some in northern New Mexico and, and surrounding states. So uh, I would say in for, for the most part, we recruit mostly ethnicity, so more likely Hispanic than anything else in our in our area. But something like 52% of the students that we are recruiting are, are female. Um, in terms of tailoring that recruiting to female students, there are some minor things that we do. In general, what we're told is that when men choose their major, they, they want to contribute to something. When women choose their major, they want to make a difference. And what we see in civil engineering is that environmental engineering specifically draws better than, say, structural engineering for, for women. Um, and largely it's, it's because that's where they most easily see that they can make a difference. So in terms of our, our recruiting efforts, that's, that's really the only, the only rule that we have in place to try to, to, try to recruit more there are a lot of efforts nationally to make STEM fields more accessible and more appealing to, to girls. Uh, we as an institution, though, don't really recruit at, at the level that those programs are implemented for. Hopefully that answers the question. It, it does. Thank you very much. Um, so a, a similar but kind of maybe opposite question uh, for uh, uh, Dr. Cancelos. Um, because you seem to be fairly successful. Um, you mentioned that UPR was number 11 in terms of granting PhDs to, to women in, in the engineering field. Um, so what, what do you think you're doing to, to generate um, women's interest in STEM? Okay, that's a tricky question because the, the numbers are good for some uh, engineering disciplines and not that good for others. Like, for example, uh, the numbers indicate that in chemical engineering, uh, like more than 50% uh, are women. Uh, in mechanical engineering, however, we have the lowest uh, percentage of uh, women, and it's about 17-18%. Uh, the College of Engineering is doing a lot of effort in recruiting women for all the engineering disciplines. Uh, typically, we organize uh, summer camps for women. Uh, so we have uh, young girls that come here and stay for a week. And we show them all the possibilities uh, in mechanical engineering and other engineering disciplines as well. Uh, that helps a lot. Uh, that summer camp is very successful. And they, I mean, a lot of uh, women that are in our program in mechanical engineering, they keep telling me that they are here thanks to that summer camp. So I think that has a, a huge impact. But also we have associations and uh, those associations organize activities uh, during the weekends uh, for young uh, ladies that go to, I mean, in high school or even middle school. Uh, sometimes they are as young as nine year old and they come here, they, they learn how to use a 3D printer, they learn how to do these uh, Legos that you can control with Arduinos, uh, so they, they can see what they can do, and uh, yeah. typically that makes uh, an impact. So uh, I cannot say that we do anything else other than, than these efforts you now with the younger uh, girls. So I, I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you so much. 
Um, so the, the next question is for Dr. Uh, Kurama. In an effort to advance NRC's mission through diversity, equity, and inclusion, did you make any distinction between Afro-Latinos and white Latinos when evaluating admission applications and matriculation? Uh, we um, tried to increase the number of applicants from uh, those groups. Um, th th uh, the group that you mentioned is also just like female applications are on the low side. Um, so we do take that into consideration, but we have not been seeing a lot of applicants um, from the Afro-Latino. Afro I guess the Latino part is, is different, actually. I should correct myself. Um, with uh, New Mexico State University's involvement, um, we have been um, uh, engaging with uh, students from the Latino community quite a bit, uh, but not the African-American community. Thank you. A similar question to uh, Professor Cancelos. Um, are, are you making that distinction um, between the Afro-Latinos and, and white Latinos in terms of acceptance and matriculation rates? The, most of the students that we have here are Puerto Ricans. Uh, we have uh, some international students that come from South America, uh, mainly Colombia, Peru, uh, some from Argentina, but not that many nowadays. So um, really we don't have a big population of students coming from other countries. Uh, at some times we were having uh, countries from China and India, uh, students coming from China and India, but now I, I've seen that lately uh, they, they haven't been uh, applying to our graduate programs. In terms of undergraduate students, uh, they, they are mainly from, from the island, mostly Puerto Ricans or Puerto Ricans that, that moved to the mainland, but uh, their kids are coming here to study. So really, we have an issue like that there. I, I, I see it as a, an opportunity. We should try to uh, expand our vision and try to uh, get students from other uh, parts of the U.S. to come study here. Uh, the tuition is cheaper, so we have an opportunity there uh, to increase uh, the diversity in our institution. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Ms. Ms. Borges. Uh, does your a &S student section develop the lessons for the K-12 NSVP, and do you use lesson plans to develop, that are, or do you use lesson plans that are developed by other organizations? Um, yeah, so actually the American Nuclear Society at a national level already has lesson plans that are available for free on their website. So for some of our events, we have relied on those. However, I think that for most of our activities, we have either adapted some of that information to be in Spanish to make it more accessible for the local population, or we've had students that have volunteered to create brand new material uh, from scratch based on uh, different topics that they're interested in. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is for Robert and Marcus. You can both take turns answering this one. C can you talk about the challenges that um, you've encountered with, with building the, the nuclear engineering curriculum? Um, and do you envision uh, getting support, not just from the NRC in the future, but, but also from industry in, in building that curriculum? Right, I think, um, so, so over the years, uh, th there have been some uh, activities ongoing, the, the, the courses were taught, you know, uh, many years ago, and then now we're restarting that. And I really, you know, rather than challenges at this point, I would like to say that I think that all of those activities that have already taken place have contributed uh, to where we are today. And where we are today is that, like we said during our presentations, we see a lot of excitement. We see a lot of awareness. We see that the, that the awareness have increased greatly, like uh, the Cire was just saying a moment ago, like that ANS student chapter is just like an amazing, again, testament of, 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 of how educated the, you know, the, the, the uh, student community has become in, in this area of the nuclear engineering field. So, so I think all of those activities have contributed to this moment in time. And it's just seemed really that this is this is this is the right time, and and we we see a bright future ahead. Uh, not only I want to um, 
uh, highlight not only from the student, but definitely from Professor Silvina and, uh, and, other, and other faculty members. And we have high hopes and expectations that this is gonna, again, thrive, uh, move forward. We, uh, Marcos and I, we, we collaborating with uh, Professor Silvina. Uh, we, so we, we developed the, the proposal that's uh, about to enter into the formal review process. So we, um, we just have high hopes that this is gonna, it's gonna move, move forward in a very uh, successful way, successful manner. Yes, I, I think uh, instead of challenges, I've, I've seen a lot of uh, support from the professors and then also uh, the students, as Robert mentioned, they have been uh, very interested in everything, uh, every, the lessons. The ANS student section, I would say, has done a lot and it has been uh, very significant that they, they, ha they are also um, uh, giving awareness not only to the students in the university, but even people uh, in the island. So that also uh, plays a big part. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Chen, um, but I think I'd like to ask everyone this question. So, so great programs on science and engineering. How much exposure do the students get to the NRC licensing process, including environmental justice considerations? But Dr. Chen, you can answer that first, but I, but I think if anybody else wants to weigh in. Um. So, um, so we do have a teaching directors here, and then uh, students can uh, have some experience uh, using the uh, teaching reactor, and then some students actually can get trained to uh, operate the reactor. And some of them actually we are um, you know, starting to uh, get some experience about the NRC licensing experience. Um, but I would say um, um, from the uh, cost um, uh, points of view, we we I don't think we cover about the NRC licensing um, topic in the um, curriculum, uh, but then students. Um, um, just one example that uh, for the senior design class, so we typically ask a student to consider the uh, RC licensing process you know, for uh, new uh, reactor designs and then um, uh, safety aspects. All right. So um, some, not not some of them. Uh, th thank you. And if, if anybody else would like to answer that question and particularly talk to any kind of exposure to environmental justice considerations. I can make some comments about Notre Dame. So at the University, University of Notre Dame, we have an energy studies minor that is um, run through the College of Science and our um, Notre Dame Center for Sustainable Energy. Um, I can't pinpoint the exact uh, curricular courses on these topics, but I'm pretty sure that they're covered uh, as part of that energy studies minor. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, so let's go to the next question. Um, and this is for you, Robert. Um, what's the most rewarding part of teaching um, at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez, and teaching those students? Oh, no, I, I very much appreciate that question. So, so it, is, it is really priceless, you know, the, the opportunity. And, uh, and just knowing that we are able, like Marcos and myself, we're able to give back what we've received, received meaning, you know, I mean, having the privilege of working here at the NRC, having been trained in, in the different nuclear engineering courses and, and just going through the NRC training program and just being able to give back to where we came from, it's, it's extremely rewarding, okay? And we found it to be priceless. And, um, and, and again, I, I know I speak for both of us here that we're just beyond grateful for, for the opportunity and, uh, and seeing the interest from the students, okay? Seeing, seeing how motivated they are, how they are hungry to learn more about this area, this uh, engineering field, and, and just seeing the expectations that they have of, of what can, uh, of, of the possible opportunities in the island or, or at an at a, at a, at a, at a island level or, or opportunities for themselves in this field is, is it's, um, it's extremely rewarding, so. All right, Mar um, so Marcos, you can add to that, but, but there's also a specific question for you. Um, what does the UPRM, what does UPRM see as the future for, uh, for the ad adjunct professor role? So, as Ruhr was saying, it, it has been a very rewarding experience, and I think uh, 
you know, just just being there brings back a lot of memories. I've known Robert since I was in college, uh, so that has it has been great uh, being back uh, and just in that capacity of teaching other students. And regarding the, the this adjunct professor experience, I think it, it has been very rewarding for us uh, personally as well because uh, we've learned to communicate a little bit more um, to to big groups, and it has been very, very interesting experience, as, as I mentioned before. Um, also, I think uh, it, our presence there has uh, contributed to, to all these efforts at the University of Puerto Rico, and there are some professors that are interested. There's one professor that comes to one of our classes, and we are uh, very happy that he's there because uh, our intention is that this program moves forward and is self-sustained. Um, after we leave uh, this uh, opportunity, then this can continue and hopefully it grows and to, to something that you know is, uh, makes a good and big contribution for our nation and for the island as well. Thank you. All right, so I think we have time for one more question, and so I'm going to make this one for everyone. Um, during the grant research, have you experienced any challenges? And do you have any recommendations on how to, to the, for the NRC on how to address them? And any recommendations in general for, for the program? Anybody want to take that? I'll, uh, I'll take that. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, as far as our project is concerned, our biggest uh, challenge so far has been actually recruiting uh, suitable graduate students for our project. Um, this is an issue that uh, has risen, um, I think, overall in engineering in the United States, especially after the COVID pandemic. Um, especially in the civil engineering side, the construction side, the industry is very strong. Uh, and students, um, and, and the industry is paying very well. Uh, so students have, a, have wonderful opportunities to go work, uh, work in the industry. So we're seeing uh, fewer um, uh, qualified students wanting to pursue the PhD. Again, nothing to do with NRC or this particular project, but in general, there's a difficulty. And this is not a Notre Dame issue either. Mm -hmm. It's a general um, difficulty across the board in the United States of finding um, good students for you know, pursuing the PhD. Dr. Chen, I saw you nod your head. Did you want to add to that? Uh, yes, we, we had the same similar issues here. Um, but then for, for my projects, um, I had one issue, which is uh, it's unexpected. So we uh, the computational resource, it turns out it's extremely high. So um, we, we the simulation case that I just mentioned during my presentation, it's 40 million sales and uh, it's uh, changing the simulation. So uh, we use like 120 um, computer, you know, you know, CPU cores, but then it taking like half a year and I know we still haven't finished all the computation. You know, the, the computation. Um, I, I, I don't have any like you know, suggestion for it. I think it's a great program to support the MSI's, you no, know, um, it's, it's, it's certainly uh, it's very um, very positive in fact you know impact our um, program here um, yeah but then we were trying to get some resources from national labs so we can um, successfully complete the our simulation and then uh, publish the results thank you if I can add something I don't know if we have the time yeah we have a couple of minutes Okay, I, I would like to say that for us, it's also hard to find a uh, good PhD students. Uh, we have um, some issues. I mean, it's, it's hard to find them everywhere, but especially here, I think it's more complicated because we lose a lot of students that go to the mainland to do the PhD. Uh, they have a lot of opportunities as being uh, Hispanic, and so it's hard for us to find them to stay here. So I found that this NRC fellowship, it's excellent because it gave me the opportunity to, to pay them well, basically, and try to convince them that, that staying here can make a difference because they, they, they get the payment as well as they get it in the, in the mainland, but also they have the opportunity to do the research here and attract uh, undergrad students that can see what they do. 
Uh, a suggestion for the program, I think the program is, 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 is excellent. We don't have many sources of funding in nuclear. There are few sources, so that's a problem. Uh, for us in particular, uh, the only thing that uh, it was hard for me was to, to have the time to recruit students. So when we first got the NRC Fellowship Award, we had to spend like six months or more in attracting students to come and work for the work with us no? under the fellowship. And because of that, it, we lost some time. No? Uh, so it might be useful if we can get maybe a, an additional year or something mm. to, to put students and after that uh, expect that they do the, the work. In other institutions where the, the, I mean, when they have a nuclear engineering degree um, in place, for them it might be easier because you already have the students and you just need to provide them the funding. But since we don't have the students and we have to recruit them, uh, pues, sometimes it's, uh, it's more complicated. But other than that, I think it's an excellent program. And, uh, and I always, like, uh, if I have the opportunity to showcase how you deal with this program, I do it. Because I, I think it's very important uh, that uh, you, you continue with, with it. And uh, it's very successful, I think. So thank that, you. That. Thank you so much. And, and that pretty much brings us to, to the end of the program. I'd like to thank all of the speakers, virtual and in person, and also the audience uh, for your attention and for all your good questions. Thank you so much. Good job, thank you. Well,